my name is Maria Jadis, and um, you know you can Google my bio. I've been around a long time. I've been a design leader for like almost 40 years. I know I look hot for my age, <laughs> but you know I have done it all from being a single designer to leading large organizations at scale. And throughout this, the course of my career, I have seen so much change just in this profession that we all love. Not only in the processes and the methods and the frameworks that we're seeing today, but also in our roles and responsibilities as designers. And even what the very definition of design itself means in today's world. And you know, you, you just saw it with Chris, how he, what does it mean to redefine what a designer means? So about 10 plus years ago, I wrote this book um, called Rise of the GEO with my co-author, Christopher Ireland, who, by the way, is a girl, and she was a very successful female CEO of a design research company called Cheskin back in the day. And um, the book was created as a result of a TED talk I gave in 2011 when I was CEO of Hot Studio, which declared rather provocatively that the best future leaders will embody the qualities and skill sets and traits of what I made up as a term called a DEO a design executive officer. And um, I define the DEO as a creative business leader who looks at business problems as design problems, solvable through the combination of imagination and metrics. And this was like, you know, more than 10 years ago. In 2011, DEOs were pretty rare at the time, but here we are 10 years later, and we're now seeing design and research leaders in some of the highest levels of organizations. You're seeing them all with all the speakers here today. Um, and so as we grow as designers from shipping products to moving up to managing people to ultimately being responsible to redesign culture, our roles uh, fundamentally change and new skills are needed to do the job. So today, I'm here to talk about this next step up in design leadership that I call becoming the change maker. So while doing this research, um, I came across this great, um, this great description of what a change maker is, excuse me. Um, from Bill Drayton, who is the founder of the nonprofit organization Ashoka. And this was his definition. Changemakers, people who can see the patterns around them, identify the problems in any situation, figure out ways to solve the problem, organize fluid teams, lead collective action, and continually adapt as situations change. To me, this was like lightning bolt in the chest moment, mic drop. <laughs> and I mean, it was done, it was written by a CEO back in like the 80s. Because this sounds an awful lot like what we do for a living, right? This is fundamentally a design description. And uh, because change is fundamentally a design problem. Therefore, change can be designed. And so here's the great news. As designers and leaders, this room, we all have the capacity, the knowledge, and the skills to be a change maker should we choose to accept the mission. And here's what's even more important to know. You all have the power to make a difference as a change maker, no matter where you sit in the hierarchy of an organization or social system. You could be an IC working on a team. You could be a director of product design leading people. You have these skills and they can be applied everywhere. 
Okay, the woo-woo section. So before we um, go into more depth of what it means to be a change maker, I want us to take a moment to reflect on what change really means to you and the people around you who are impacted by change. So during the pandemic, I became an executive coach. I also became a shamanic counselor. You could ask me about that later. So it's a little woo-woo, but trust me, trust me here. I want you all to just kind of chill out. Put your feet on the floor, maybe both feet if you can. Put your phones away. Here's the scary part. I want you to close your eyes. And just take a moment in the silence to focus on your breathing. Just focus on your breathing. I want you to start taking a couple of deep breaths, slow deep breaths in through the nose and some slow breaths out through the mouth. And I know this is hard for this conference, but I want you to pay I want you to move from your head to your heart. Drop all those thoughts. They'll come back later, and I want you to drop into your heart right now. And now I want you to think of a recent memory in which you experienced a big change in your life. At work or at home. At work, it could be a major reorg or a promotion. Could have been fired. Could have been the arrival of a new CEO. In your personal life, it could be the birth of a new baby, a death of a loved one, or even a big move. And I really want you to connect yourself to that event and to see if you can tap into how that event made you feel. And I want you to connect with what others might have felt around you at that event in your life. And I want you to sit with those emotions just for a little while. And after you've dialed that in, I want you to start returning to the room, starting to feel the surface under you, taking some deep breaths in through the nose and out through the mouth. And when you're ready to come back gently in the room, you could open your eyes. Does anybody want to share? They don't have to, you don't have to share the story. I, can, can anybody share some of the emotions that came up, the words that came up for you when you tapped into that emotion? Just yell them out one at a time. What did you, what did you feel, depending on the context? Wait a minute, I heard scared. Yell louder. What? Energized. Energized. What else? Purpose. What was it? Purpose. Purpose. What else? Concerned. Concerned. Happy. Happy. Proud. Excitement. Excitement. Joy. Joy. Disappointed. Yeah. I mean, this is very typical. You are, when you hear, when you think about change, you are going to get a huge range from perhaps utter devastation to complete elation. And this is because, as human beings, we are all wired for survival. Any kind of change triggers a chemical response in our brains. Neurotransmitters carry chemical signals that either trigger a positive reward response, which allows us to be optimistic, 
creative and open-minded and being open to change, or more often than not, a negative threat response, which causes us to shut down and be closed-minded and be resistant to change, which triggers our survival instinct of fight, flight, or flee. And depending on the circumstances, the context, and our own life experiences, people will have different reactions to change, which will influence their behaviors, their actions, and their beliefs. This reaction to change in yourself as well as others, whether it's a positive reward response, as I mentioned, or a negative closed response, will determine whether or not you are working with supporters, fence sitters, or all out even resistors to change. And this is just one of the reasons why leading change is such hard work. Because at this point in our lives, as Chris just pointed out, the world and society seem more fragmented than ever before. Outdated change management systems are rigid and rule-bound. And these systems no longer work in a volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous world, which now requires fluidity, interconnectedness, and inclusion. And design-driven change can be the path forward, and the world needs our help. So the post-COVID world really, in some ways, was a gift because it has solidly ushered in this new era. And design-driven leaders, us, we have the right talents, we have the right skill sets and the right processes to lead this revolution. Stefan uh, kicked it off this morning and proved to us that we were all born creative. And design-driven leaders do not necessarily need design training or even do design. Everyone can embrace, and everyone can embrace design when they treat it as a mindset and a strategy, activate the creative problem-solving parts of our brain, put people at the center of everything we do, are open to collaboration and experimentation, and treat failure as a way of learning. So thinking back to my last corporate job as a VP of design, I realized I was in a very high position and that many of these change-making skills, even though I've had a long career, most of these skills were fairly new to me and it required a lot of on-the-job training. And if you ask me, I crushed it. I did a lot of things really well. But I also made a lot of mistakes, and I have the battle scars to prove them. Uh, I just started interviewing, I made a long list, and we interviewed over 40 people, not only in design leadership, but in education, and social justice, and business, um, and other, in other industries. And so today, I'm, and, we, and then we, we comprised all those insights to create this book. Today, I'm going to share six lessons that are the top mistakes that have been made by these change makers. And um, you know, some of these lessons may seem like no-brainers, yet, yet, when we find ourselves in these positions of powers, we all make them. We all fall victim to them. And I can guarantee that I have made every single mistake that I'm going to share with you today. Um, so, how's that sound? So far, so good? Yeah. Yes? Can I, hear, can I hear a hell yes? yes. All right, okay. Okay, we'll start with one. Number one, failure to determine the ground conditions for success. So, the very first mistake the change makers make is to f to f to f is the failure to determine these ground conditions for success before they accept the mission. 
Um, so if I had to really unpack my own life experience here, when I accepted this job at Autodesk as a VP, I could have done a better job with due diligence on the ground conditions before accepting that role. This way, I would have, you know, I probably would have said yes anyway, but I would have been more equipped for what lied ahead. Um, when I started my job, it was clear that I had the executive support, but it was unclear who else was in a position of power that might not fully embrace the mission. It was unclear whether or not my mission would even be fully funded. I didn't even ask the question. It was unclear who would be on my team to execute what I was told to do, which wasn't at all really clearly defined. And if I had to do a do-over, I would have asked more questions up front. So before you accept the role of a change um, maker, you got to ask yourself these questions. Do you have a clear directive for change from your leadership team? Because having clear direction helps you understand what needs to change, why it needs to change, and who will benefit from the change. Do you have a powerful champion on your side who will have your back in the good times and the bad times? Because it is not worth your time and effort if your executive team does not support the mission. Continuous education and evangelism and support is needed by what I call enlightened leaders, right? Let's face it, there's only a, there's a small percentage of leaders out there who really understand what we do. And our job continues to be education and evangelism. Um, and so we need that support from that enlightened leader who gets us. Do you have the right resources for the change to happen? Because those who are requesting the change need to put their money where their mouth is. And that means that every change initiative should come with a reasonable time frame to execute, a realistic budget, and people with the right capabilities and skill sets needed to do the job. So I know what you're saying right now. You're probably like, yeah, right. And, San and I believe in Santa Claus, too. Right? I know. I could hear it. I could feel it. Remember, it's the shaman. I could feel you. <laughs> Sounds real un unrealistic, but if you do not have these things in place, it feels like pushing water upstream. It's not impossible, but you need to prepare yourself for challenges that lie ahead, and you need to reset your expect expectations about what is possible for change. OK, that was number one. Number two is what um, the VP of Uber at the time, Michael Goff, said, coming in too hot. I love that term. Because let's face it, we are all very passionate people. I mean, you know, nobody hires a design team to maintain the status quo. We love change. Even though change can be scary depending on the context, when people ask us to change, it feels a little bit like taking drugs, doesn't it? Right? So we're passionate people. So when we are in a position of power to make change, we're like firefighters who run into this burning building. Um, and so we come into these companies as change makers thinking we are the chosen one. We are the savior who are going to fix everything. And we might ignore all the work that has been, been done before us that face similar challenges. We might ignore all the projects that have failed before us, not knowing why they even failed in the first place. And we might ignore all the voices that have different opinions from us. And that will eventually lead you to be burnt to a crisp, building lots of resistance along the way. So instead, take the time to listen and learn from all the people you work with and the customers that they care about. 
I often like to say this, we're trained to be these relentless advocates for customers. Can we apply that a same amount of empathy and compassion to the people that we work with? Learn about the culture and pay attention to what the energy feels like. Ben did a whole talk today about how to assess cultural compatibility and organizational readiness. And listen to your gut. Sometimes you kind of know it's not, something's not working, but you ignore your gut. Listen to it. Pay attention to what your intuition might be telling you. So when I joined Autodesk um, as a change maker, I really didn't have a clear understanding what my mission was. And when I finally got there, my boss impatiently asked me for a plan right away. Sounds familiar, right? So I told him straight out that I needed time to meet and listen to people. And I told my boss to give me three months to go on a listening tour. I probably did it in 30 days, but I did ask for 90. Um, and as designers and researchers, this, this is one of our core superpowers, listening, to stay curious, asking open-ended questions without bias and attachments to outcomes. So let's use them. And so I, so I went and I did my like designerly thing and I built my stakeholder map that Nathan was showing earlier and I dent all the people that I should be talking to. And I did that. I talked to all the important primary, secondary, tertiary stakeholders on my stakeholder map. But then my goal really was to talk to as many people as possible. So I traveled around the world and I sat in kitchens. And I talked to anybody who was willing to talk to me. And Mina, really today, she talked about that importance of engaging people in conversation and listening, making that human connection with somebody. And I asked these five questions to everybody, and I just listened. And within those uh, 30 to 30 days to 90 days, I talked to over 300 people, um, up, down, and across the organization. And I look, then I had data, and then I looked for common themes that continuously bubbled up, because that's what we do, um, which became the basis for vision and a platform for change. Which brings me to mistake number three. Um, lack of building support in creating a shared vision. So, Having a good vision is a lot like uh, creating a North Star, um, which can inspire and motivate everyone around a common belief system. And I, I like to define this as vision provides the why, why the change needs to happen and why people should care about it. I also, uh, it can also paint um, a perspective of what the future could look like as a result of that change. But here's the important thing. Vision cannot be created in a design team in a vacuum. Because much of the insights gained from the listening tour can be folded into the vision, along with many of the tools and techniques we already use to collect and to distill information. So we have the tools, but the best vision are those where participants can see their perspectives, their participation and their input um, in, in the outcome of this vision. So Cheryl talked about the importance of making stakeholders part of the process. This is critical for vision. And Nathan talked about the importance of using shared language as a mean to build aligned goals. I, I will also like to say, like when you really think about it, we always think that we're these aliens that have this language that we have to use and then jam it through a culture. But if you really stop and listen to what people care about, you can realize that everybody's multilingual, but they all are saying the same thing. I do like to say, I really do believe 
people don't like to make shitty products, right? Nobody, we all think we're the only ones that are protecting the integrity of product. Nobody really wants to make shared products. We're just speaking different languages. So if you can deconstruct that and use a shared language, you can get pretty, pretty far in getting adoption. And more, uh, more important than anything else in all this, coming back to the human element, it's about being seen and heard. And when people feel seen and heard, especially from leaders in high places, that support for the vision will grow. And the name of the game, uh, trust was talked about a lot this afternoon. I was pretty happy about it. Although I think, Nathan, my version is better than yours. <laughs> it's okay, I love Nathan. Nathan and I go back a long way. <laughs> he, will, he will spend uh, drinks, he will over drinks, he will tell me why I'm wrong, so don't worry. He's, he's, gonna, he's gonna go there. The name of the game is to build trust by finding common ground. And working with people is a lot like mountain climbing. Um, everyone has to go at their own pace in order to cross over the edge. So a real common mistake for us is we fall in love with our own ideas. And we think we might have the authority to, so you must adopt my vision. Or, I've done all the research, I have evidence. I have quantitative data and qualitative data. I am not wrong, you are wrong. Um, or, you know, it's my way or the highway, right? We, we fall in love with our ideas, we try to back them up with evidence. But people don't, it's not really what they're asking for. Right? It's, their, it's, their light, it's their world view that has to be changed. So this will lead you to build resistors who will root for you to fail, and then they're going to dance over your grave. So there's, there's a lot of death references in this talk. <laughs> um, so the best way to handle people's attitude towards change is to really find common interest, common interests, common goals, um, and common needs and hold and fold all of that into the vision. And this is really especially important and it's especially important to pay attention and listen to and fold insights from stakeholders whose interests run counter to your own. I love this, this is so clear in my book. I interviewed a lot of people, but I love this little quote um, from uh, Sarah Brooks. Um, she says, nobody wants to be told to do your thing unless it's clear that it helps their thing. It's just human nature. I just love, it's simple and it's true. So, coming back, while I was uh, VP um, at Autodesk, my boss, Amar Hans Paul, who's also been interviewed in the book, he would constantly, I was that person, I was like, I just spoke to 300 people. I have a list this long of all the things that need to change, right? It was a long ass list. And then he would go, Maria, try not to boil the ocean. I hated, it was like nails on a chalkboard for me. Don't boil the ocean, don't boil the ocean. I think every, every um, you know, uh, every check-in, he would remind me not to boil the ocean. Um, and he also said something really like profound. He said, if you want to drive lasting change, you need to break it down into three or four steps. Because as change makers, we often get overwhelmed with the sheer amount of things that need our attention. And we want to accomplish big things. So it is easy to take on way too many things, which means you run the risk of doing nothing well without any clear wins or focus. So it's important to be clear on priorities and scope and be realistic what you can accomplish. I know a lot of people are like, are afraid to tell the truth, but it comes at a cost if you don't tell people what it takes to accomplish something well. And focus on a few things to work on. Achieve some wins that show measurable results that will be seen and valued by your senior leadership team. So it's not only the amount,
but what are the things that are going to be critically important that are going to be noticed by people in power? It is equally important to communicate and be clear about those things that you are saying no to. So you can focus on to do the, do the right things really well, but you're setting the expectation and you're communicating clearly what you will not be working on. So we interviewed Catherine Courage. She is the VP of something, something at Google. You know, she's like high up there now. Um, and she had this to say about prioritization. You need to seriously prioritize and hold your conviction to avoid the tendency to do everything at once. It takes maniacal focus. And that's hard because you have to remain flexible. Priorities will always change and you will have to adapt. But this can't mean that you take on more and more work. So pick a small set of things and really shine. Otherwise, you run the risk of burning out, accomplishing nothing. And so there are so many prioritization tools that you can use. This is the one that I like to use, but you know, use one that works for your team. Um, this is a tool I call the impact matrix. You can Google it. It's uh, well used on a lot of teams. Um, but the reason why I like this particular tool for prioritization is because it can help you determine three things at a team relatively quickly. It can help you to determine which projects have the, right, the highest impact, along with an understanding around the level of effort needed. That's the first one. Which projects are the quick, easy wins that Amar was referring to? And which product, projects are a no or not yet? Just because it, you don't get to it doesn't mean it's not important. So it might be a no, but it could be, it just might, might not be now. There are other priorities. And then from this perspective of collective uh, prioritization, from this perspective, you can make decisions along how to determine allocation and time. You can do this very frequently. OK, one of the most mission critical components of any change initiative, this is, this is table stakes that we often take for granted. It is clear communication. Good, clear, honest communication will unite team members and stakeholders around a consistent shared vision. It will reinforce clear expectations, goals, and non-goals around a project. It can celebrate project successes and progress, and it can identify any blockers or delays that get in the way. Now, on the other hand, bad, infrequent, opaque communication will allow others to fill in the gaps with their own stories and interpretations, create distrust and rumor mills, and ultimately build resistors to change. So at the outset of every project, build in a clear communication plan that will be appropriate for you, your team, and any phase of the project. Um, and build in a plan that works, that's whatever appropriate, uh, you know, different, different organizations have different ways of communicating, right? So build in a plan that is appropriate and meaningful to your organization. Um, you know, for example, we love to use Slack. That doesn't necessarily mean your company is going to be using Slack, or we might be using it for the wrong reasons. So appropriate, being appropriate is really important. And when it comes to communing process, I love to communicate as visually as possible, because when you communicate visually, it makes things easier to remember. Um, Justin McGuire, he was the former um, chief design officer at Salesforce. 
Um, and he spoke to us and he talked about communication. And he said, communication style and knowing how to bring people along is almost everything. You need to establish clear expectations around communication channels, frequency, and even tonality, even if it falls outside of your own comfort zone. So how to, you know, how to think about this really quickly. Who, what, when, when, who, went, who, what, where, when, how, right? Who's the audience for the communication? What needs to be communicated? Why is this communication important to the receiver? When will the communication be delivered and how frequently? And how will this communication be sent and received? Lastly, we're coming up to number six, failure to iterate, adapt, and evolve. So we all said this change is inevitable and conditions will always change and priorities will change and you'll have to pivot and adapt. That is part of what we do. But be sure to build that into your process from day one. Um, it's important to benchmark your starting point and determine the best way to measure and monitor your impact. There's a lot of discussion around measurement today. I don't care how you do it, just do it. Doug Powell, who's the former executive IBM, tells me um, that he regretted not measuring impact from day one because it hindered his ability to demonstrate process and progress. So, when we do measure and monitor, it inevitably leads to iteration, adaptation, and evolution, which provides a pathway to bring things to scale. So be sure, and then while you're iterating, what also comes with that is feedback loops. So be sure to build in adequate feedback loops throughout every phase of your process. And let's face it, guys, feedback can be difficult to hear. You know, by the way, I never read reviews about my performance, because <laughs> I can't handle the negative feedback myself. <laughs> um, so it's hard, especially when it's really critical of your hard work. Um, and it's difficult not to take it personally, but it's pr so uh, it makes it easy to avoid when we don't ask for it, right? Or build it into a process, because who wants to hear bad news anyway? <laughs> But I find retrospectives essential. They are an excellent vehicle to identify key issues that need improvement, but are also a way to acknowledge progress and, um, and team success. So it's not just about what to fix, but it's also about what, let's celebrate what really worked well. And uh, Christina Woodkey is a lecturer and an author. Um, and uh, when she was working as a product leader, she had this thing called Friday is for winners. And so she would have a retro, essentially a retrospective, but they celebrated all the failures. But they called, they called the retrospective Fridays is for winners. I thought that was so beautiful. Um, so what are the celebration rituals that you're gonna do for your team? Gratitude goes a long way. Um, so find ways to publicly acknowledge people for a job well done. Um, because acknowledgments humanize the effort and make team members happy, healthy, motivated, and ultimately productive. So when you join the company as a change maker and have been given this clear path to lead, done well, you can expect the path to look like this. You are on a roll. You are optimistic. What can possibly go wrong? But then reality sets in, and we've all been here. The journey looks like this. That shiny glow of newness will wear off, and you will experience bumps along the road. And about two years in, according to Seth Godin, um, you may ex start to experience deep dips. And when we're in a dip, we go into those three survival modalities, fight, flight, or quit, or freeze, or just hide until the political winds change. You might even lose your job. And 
Most people actually leave prematurely. The reality is failure is inevitable, and it sucks, and it hurts, and it takes a lot of time to recover. And I remember interviewing John Maeda when he said this, Maria, failure is easy, recovery is hard, but it's necessary and it's part of the process because if you haven't failed in business, that's a clear indication that you have not taken enough risk. Once again, Justin McGuire says, fall on the sword and own your mistakes and then ask how you can learn from them. And the higher up you go in an organization, the harder you will fail. But be courageous because bouncing back from failure will only make you stronger. And based on personal experiences, when you hit that lowest point and the pain feels almost intolerable, you will begin to experience those moments of clarity and insight, which will spark your creativity and allow you to see new possibilities in life. The famous boxer Muhammad Ali once said, if I didn't experience a loss, I would never know what I'm capable of. So you got to embrace the low points, as painful as they are, because once you hit the bottom, and once you can clear out the noise in your head, creativity will flourish, and then it will be time to iterate and evolve, and it will be time to redesign. So my dear fellow leaders, change makers, and other rebels in the audience here, change is hard, and it's uncomfortable, and it takes courage, it takes audacity, and it takes resilience. And there's lots of setbacks, and it's messy. But as a change maker, it's important to remember that there is no such thing as a finish line. Your measure of success is progress, the progress that you have made while you were there. And the impact that you have created while you were there has left a marker for the next change maker to pick up where you have left off. Just look around. I just want you to take a moment and soak in this group of people right here. Just look at each other, love each other. There are 44 countries represented in this room. The world needs our help, and the time for change is right now, and you are the leaders that we have all been waiting for. And if you do believe that change is worth fighting for, Find that motivation to keep going, especially when it gets hard. So my challenge for you today is to share your successes and failures with others as you all level up in your own experiences as a change maker. And together, as this coalition of willing, we can redesign the future for ourselves, for our families, for our community, and ultimately the world. So let's get to work. So I'm going to leave you with this very, very prolific haiku from uh, GPT chat. And uh, I really, again, this has been an amazing conference. I am so uh, filled with hope when I see all these faces in the audience. Go get them. If you have any questions, come talk to me. Um, this has been an incredible conference. I hope you're energized. I hope you're ready to be change makers. I'm hoping you're ready to party tonight because I am. Thank you so much, everybody. Yeah.